All right, policies and proxies crash course. As discussed, this is talking about the policy manager, system manager, local management of the Firebox, not the WatchGuard cloud side of things. That is going to be a completely different animal when it comes to setting up policies and proxies. There are some similarities in uh, creating actions and knowing the difference between policies and setting to and from source and destination, but focusing on policy manager here. So real quickly, uh, we're going to talk about policies in general source destination aliases, some of the default policies on a locally managed box, hidden policies, working with policy precedents, you know, knowing which one is actually going to be active, setting up logging, uh, scheduling, and then what's the difference between a packet filter and a proxy, right? Uh, kind of an important distinction there. And then getting into proxies, that's really kind of the meat and potatoes of the idea of a unified threat management next generation firewall. The proxies are where all of the security services actually live. So we'll talk about those in a little more detail. As always, if you have any questions, you know, put them in chat or just speak up right away and we'll try to address them. Uh, but I'm going to try to get through this pretty quickly. There's a lot of slides to go through, but I think most of this information will be review. It's common for literally every firewall router type of device for the most part until we get to the proxies and security services. So first of all, every policy, you have to define where you're coming from and where you're going to. Those can be distinct IP addresses. They can be host ranges. They can be aliases, specific users or groups, VPN tunnels, qualified domain names, or any combination. So it, you don't have to, in WatchGuard products, you don't have to have a separate policy for you know uh, a single IP versus an IP subnet. Right. Some firewall devices will make you create different policy log lines. Uh, I'm thinking of some of the older ASAs, for example, where you can't combine multiple source and destinations into a single policy. With us, you can. You can have that, you know, you just add them into that block to from any combination of those. And you can also have static NAT, SNAT actions uh, as a policy destination. So if you're NATing, uh, you know, if traffic comes in, to port 443, send it to this web server over here, right? You can have that as your policy destination. When we talk about adding an alias to those source and destinations, these are just shortcut names that you define or the built-in ones, right? And those shortcuts can be, again, host IP addresses, subnets, network interfaces, virtual interfaces, VLANs, it's just a collection, a little group placeholder, so you don't have to type the same thing in 20 times. We have a bunch of default ones, right? So we have default zones, which are essentially mapped to the physical interfaces on the devices. So any trusted would be any internal interface, the LAN interfaces. Any optional would be your DMZ interfaces, if you've def defined any physical interfaces as you know optional. Any external is your WAN port, or ports if you have multi-WAN, and any BOVPN if you're using virtual interfaces on your BOVPNs, which we talked about in the previous training, you can use BOVPN in there as well. There are a couple of default aliases. Firebox is an important one. Uh, Firebox means the device itself, not traffic passing through the device, but the actual Firebox when it's trying to reach out and talk to DNS or talk to WatchGuard Cloud or whatever all of the IP addresses that the Firebox understands as itself. And then of course, any, which is literally any, right? Uh, one thing you, you probably don't wanna do is have a policy that says like source any, destination any, traffic any, right? That just negates your firewall ent entirely, right? Never do that. Uh, I've known some people to do that, you know, for testing purposes or whatever, but that is pretty dangerous. So be careful when using any. So you can also, as I mentioned before, an alias can be a single IP address, a network range, a uh, network or CIDR mask, a subnet, wildcard addresses, specific host names, fully qualified domain names, including wildcards there, BOVPN addresses or the name of the tunnel itself. Uh, you can create custom aliases you can nest aliases within each other so you can do like a group of groups type of thing in your aliases so if you've got i don't know hypothetically uh 
uh, one that says all internal users, you can drop in multiple groups or multiple groups plus subnets and, you know, again, nest those together. So far so good? Good, okay. I know I'm going really fast on this, but again, I wanna knock this we out. We use some of those stuff uh, pretty often, like with the aliases and stuff like that's, uh, if not, we'd be locked out um, of half of these devices. So normally we set them up with, uh, we have two locations, an El Paso location and a San Antonio location. So mm -hmm. we, we normally have to make sure that we, I, I just went through and updated all the aliases for us to make sure we could access them. Right, yeah, super use, uh, common use case there, exactly is you know, your MSP office, your your office, you want to alias any of the locations you're coming to uh, for you know VPN use or for management purposes, lock those those ports down to only allow access from your offices, but you don't want to have to type that in a hundred times, right? And you're right though, that's important because when I was going through one of our, our devices, um, something may have happened there and there was a, you know, I'm, I'm, I was reviewing the policies and, uh, you know, allow any external, not good. So yeah, that's that's very very bad. Um, you know that that's uh, that's dangerous, right? So you absolutely want to lock those down. Cool. All right, let's talk about some of the default policies and management policies, because that, that ties into that exact thing, right? WatchGuard Web UI. Uh, this is this is a biggie, right? And this came up unfortunately with the whole Cyclops Blink thing. Uh, we had some partners who did have WatchGuard Web UI open to any external just to make it easier to manage from anywhere. And that obviously is basically leaving the front door open for attackers to start trying to brute force your, your web UI and break into the box. So you never want to do that. By default, the web UI allows any trusted and optional. So anything that's behind the Firebox by default can connect to the web UI. You may want to still lock that down even more so uh, just for best practices. Now, important note, the virtual firewalls, Firebox Cloud and Firebox V, actually have that any external open for the web UI because that's the only way to configure them initially. Uh, because we don't, you you can't create the actual interfaces on the device until it's built in the hypervisor, whatever that is, AWS or Azure or ESX, whatever. So we have to have that for the initial configuration. So you have to go back immediately after deploying it and setting up your interfaces and change that policy. The other ones, uh, the WatchGuard policy, as it's called, this is the one that's actually used for Systems Manager, Policy Manager, and also for SSH access. And so System Manager WSM is going to connect on TCP 4117, and SSH will tunnel over to 4118. So those are two default policies that are created on locally managed devices to allow accessing it from management server, WSM, or whatever. And typically, again, those will always be any trusted, any optional by default. Uh, you may want to just go ahead and drop the any optional from that and only leave it to any trusted or lock it down to a specific, you know, bastion server, management server, whatever it may be, single host or single network that you want to allow access from. For example, you know, your main office uh, alias would be a great choice there. So you don't want anyone just mucking around, you know, knowing that there's a watch guard in place, download WSM and start trying to hammer the device. When you go through the setup wizard, when you're doing a quick start on a box, it creates policies for you. You may or may not be doing this. Uh, I'm sure you know, your organization probably has a kind of a standard template or an XML that you reuse for your, your uh, customers. But a lot of folks, when they take the box out, they just, go through the setup wizard, the quick start, and it will create a couple of default policies for them to get the basic services up and running so that they can use it out of the box without having to create everything from scratch. So it creates an HTTP proxy, HTTPS proxy, and an FTP proxy that allows any internal host from trusted or optional to access the web, right? Just pretty standard web policies there. Uh, personally, I think we could drop FTP. I don't know that many people that are using it anymore, but it's, you know, it's been in there for 26 years. And <laughs> so that's one of the defaults. We also allow ping. Uh, I believe ping is actually an any any. You need to double check that. We allow outbound DNS requests, right? Because it doesn't help to have a web policy if you can't re resolve the domain names. We also, by default, will create a policy to access the WatchGuard certificate portal. 
So the CERT portal is important if you are using content inspection with the HTTPS proxy. That will allow you to download the WatchGuard Firebox certificate to import to your clients so that you don't get that browser error that says, hey, this, this certificate doesn't match the website I'm expecting to go to. So by default, we'll add that portal in there as well. You may or may not be using content inspection, and that's something that you know we'll talk about a little bit later in the proxy to, uh, definitions, but just be aware that that's going to be open. And then we have a standard outgoing policy that's kind of a catch-all. Uh, anything that's not web traffic, not ping, not DNS, we're going to generically allow TCP UDP traffic from any internal host to access any external host. A lot of our more security minded folks will delete the outgoing policy and uh, just work with you know the traffic monitor look for what traffic is actually being used and create explicit you know specific policies for the traffic they want to be allowed that's not uncommon uh, but typically in a more average uh, kind of you know less locked down environment the outgoing policy is kind of a nice catch-all in case something is doing something you know not over a standard port 80 port 443. So we have a couple of hidden policies and you've probably seen these actually pop up in traffic monitor. Uh, specifically like the unhandled packet things. So unhandled internal packet is looking at traffic originating within your network and leaving to the Internet and it's going to deny that if it doesn't match a policy. Again, that previously, the, the outgoing policy is basically going to allow just about any traffic that's going out. But if you delete that, you'll start seeing those unhandled internal packet messages. And you'll be like, OK, well, there's the port and protocol I need to create a policy for. I guarantee you've seen unhandled external packet. That's traffic coming into your network from the internet so this is going to be people doing port scans this is people you know poking holes at your firewall to see if they can get through it right you will definitely see that this is all those you know botnets and everything the first thing you see before some of the the threat protection kicks in will be the unhandled external packet right people trying to connect to rdp or trying to connect to ssh or whatever it may be this is also you know both of those are, are useful for troubleshooting when you are creating new policies when you're looking for you know hey I've, I've got this policy i think i've got it right but my traffic still isn't pa passing you know watch for unhandled internal or external packets and it may help you troubleshoot where you need to tune that to actually allow traffic there is an any from firebox so remember i said the firebox is an alias right we have a, a hidden policy, any from Firebox, that allows it to communicate out to the world. If that were deleted, you would have a brick sitting in your environment and you would not be able to pass any traffic. We have to tell the box itself, yes, you can pass traffic out to the internet. And then if you create an IPsec or IKV2 VPN, BO VPN or end user VPN, we create a hidden policy in there to allow the Ike traffic. So that's opening up UDP 500, uh, to actually allow it to accept that traffic in. So policy precedents. Much like uh, basically all vendors, our policies are ordered top down. So when you're reading through the list, when we parse the policies, when we're looking at a packet and trying to match it to a policy, it starts at the top of the list. Uh, the first policy that matches will be the one that's used and we stop processing. So if you have two policies that will act on the same kind of traffic in two different ways, only the first one will be used. So it's important to know what the policy precedence is. By default, we will use auto order mode. So the Firebox will try to decide itself what the logical order is. So it checks for the specificity of the policy, which means if you have one policy that says allowed uh, any source TCP to any destination TCP. And then you have another policy that says allow 10, 10, 10, 20 to, you know, 66, 65, 66, one. That is that second one is more specific and that will be ordered higher in the list than your any any policy. Next, it checks for ports and protocols. So if you have one policy that says uh, generic TCP UDP and another one that says HTTP 80, 
the HTTP 80 is going to be more specific and higher in the list than the generic TCP. It checks for the source and destinations. Uh, what is the action? Does it have no action defined or specific action defined? And then lastly, schedule. Policies that have a schedule applied to them will be, <clears throat> and we talked about scheduling in a second, but they will be higher in the list than an open anytime policy. So not terribly important to know exactly what is going to be higher in precedence there. Auto order mode is basically on or off, right? But it can be useful to understand, like, why does auto order mode keep putting this policy ahead of another one? Oh, look, it's got a schedule on it. That's why, right? Uh, a lot of folks will simply disable auto order mode with their locally managed devices because it gives you more control over what happens first. Every policy can set up logging and or notifications. So send a log message will bring up a log line in traffic monitor. Send a log message for reports, which is a separate checkbox, sends logs to Dimension or to WatchGuard Cloud, and then less commonly used SNMP traps or notifications. Uh, most people have not been using notifications a lot over the last couple of years, although I'm seeing a few more now with WatchGuard Cloud because we actually have a rule in WatchGuard Cloud that says, send me an email if I get an alarm from the firebox. Um, so one of the important things about notifications is that the email and pop-ups, those are really not terribly useful. Uh, for the pop-up, for example, you have to be sitting in Firebox System Manager looking at it right there to actually receive the pop-up. Most people don't do that. Um, the email requires you to configure an SMTP server. A lot of people skip that step. So that's less important. But send a log message and send a log message for reports are very important uh, for just for basic traffic monitoring and troubleshooting. By default, uh, we're going to log any denied traffic, right? We will send a log message to traffic monitor for denied traffic. Uh, and you'll always see those unhandled external packets. You're never going to get rid of those. We will usually not log uh, allowed traffic because that just creates too much noise in the traffic monitor, right? You don't want to have like every single HTTP hit for every web browsing session pop up in traffic monitor. You just wouldn't be able to follow the traffic. So a lot of times, uh, especially for those default policies that are created in the quick start, we will not be sending a log message for those. Now, that's easy to change, right? It's a checkbox. You can go in there and simply check the box that says, hey, I want to see a log because I'm troubleshooting my traffic. I need to figure out what's going on. So I mentioned earlier policy scheduling, right? So you can set a schedule on your policies to make them active only at certain times. By default, the policies are always on. That means they're always active. But there may be use cases where you want to say, uh, I only want to allow this traffic during business hours or, uh, you know, if it's uh, uh, one of the going back to the, the bad old days where we had stuff like dial up or whatever. I want to have my main policy active for web browsing during business hours, but then flip over to a cheaper circuit, a backup link. So send my traffic out on the weekends this way. Um, you know, so policy schedules allow you to further tune and define when something is going to be active. Again, if two policies are otherwise the same, the one with the tighter schedule will have a higher order precedence if you're using auto order mode. All right, so let's talk about the difference between a packet filter and a proxy. So packet filters are effectively going way, way back to the beginning of the days of TCP IP and routers. Packet filters are essentially those basic ACLs that you create on a router, right? Access control list. You set a source and a destination, a port and protocol in a packet filter. That's it. I'm coming from here, going to there on this port and this protocol. Packet filters are great for broadly allowing or denying traffic. And they're very, very fast and very, very efficient, but there's not a lot that you can do with them outside of that. It's not looking into the packet. It's not looking at the data. You're not applying any security services to it. 
you're simply allowing or denying based on the the header of the data itself. So on the other hand, are again that next generation UTM filtering. So it's actually not only looking at the source destination port and protocol, but looking into the body of the message. It's looking at any attachments. It's inspecting the content. It's inspecting you know, the commands, making sure that the packet that is being sent adheres to your security policy and applying any security services to it. So the most important thing to know there is that you know most of what we do on the WatchGuard is going to be a proxy. There are a couple of you know default policies in there, things like ping, right? That's a basic packet filter. But you know normally it's going to be a proxy. Talk about what kinds of proxies those are. We have a bunch of standard proxy types, right? DNS, FTP, the H323 and SIP ALGs uh, for VoIP and, and video traffic. I know that's something that your organization has had experience with, and they can be problematic depending on what kind of PBX you're using. We really want to move away from those ALGs, but we still have them for some purposes. Um, application layer gateway is the ALG acronym there. HTTP, HTTPS proxies, SMTP, POP3, IMAP, and then a generic TCP UDP proxy for all ports for the TCP or UDP. These are all supported as proxies, which means you can apply security services to them. So, you know, web blocker, spam blocker, gateway antivirus, things like that. Oh, and then the uh, explicit proxy, very different use case. This is basically, you know, when you go into your browser configuration and it says, you know, require a proxy to browse the internet, you can define the Firebox as a web proxy server to browse the internet. I don't know that many people that actually do that anymore, uh, but the explicit proxy is for that. So when we talk about proxies, every proxy has to have an action of some kind associated with it. Uh, usually, I mean, sometimes those actions may not actually be doing anything, right? They may have been created by the defaults or the quick setup wizard, and they don't actually have anything turned on. But every proxy has to have some kind of a proxy action, and you will see that HTTP action, HTTPS action. So one of the things that can be confusing for people is that we have actions with a dot standard on them. So you'll see like HTTPS proxy or HTTPS action dot standard, client dot standard, server dot standard, uh, and that's mentioned there as well. Client, server. DNS in, out, explicit, and ALG only have one version of them. And then you'll also see some that say default. So it'll be like default uh, HTTPS client dot standard, which gets really super confusing. All you need to know specifically is that dot standard are kind of our quote unquote best practices, better practices, recommendations. The ones with the name default on them are created by the quick setup wizard. So if you went through that quick start rather than creating your own uh, configuration from scratch, those are the quick setup wizard ones and they're built off of the dot standard ones. Uh, when you are applying the proxies to the policies, or sorry, applying the actions to the proxies, the main ones that you want to watch out for are things like those HTTP and HTTPS client versus server. So client is going to be the most common one you use. That's your your people inside the internet or inside your LAN browsing the internet, right? Server is when you're hosting a web server in your environment and you want to inspect traffic that the internet is sending to you for your, your web pages you're hosting. So nine times out of 10, uh, most sites are going to be using just the client stuff, right? But be aware that the server is there if you've got a, a web farm and a DMZ or something like that. So a lot of the security services must have those proxies and those proxy actions defined. So gateway antivirus, DLP, which is moving, we're moving away from that. Uh, we won't have DLP moving forward in the new, well, we don't in the new devices, so it's uh, going to be phased out in a couple of years here. APT blocker, spam blocker, web blocker, reputation enabled defense, 
uh, geolocation. Those are all defined on the proxy actions. And then you apply the proxy action to a proxy within a policy. Good. Yeah. OK. I don't see any comments and nobody's spoken up, so I think we're good. All right, so let's talk about gateway antivirus and the other antivirus scanned layers. So gateway antivirus is obviously a powerful tool. This is going to get a little bit worried here. It's a powerful tool that protects your clients from inbound malware. Now, it is powerful, but it can also be uh, fairly heavyweight, right? So you want to make sure that you're not just scanning the internet, right? So if you want to allow content in, select AV scan. If you want to block it entirely, don't scan it. There's no reason to scan something that you're just going to end up blocking, right? So if there is particular types of content that you know you don't want to allow in, say like executables, for example, if you don't want people to be able to download EXEs, just block them, drop it, right? For something that you want to scan, you know, maybe PDFs, Office documents, whatever, select the AV scan action. And if there's content that you don't care about scanning, like HTML, right, just allow it. So when you go through the quick setup, the default proxy actions enable AV scans and they en enable it for our dot standard kind of recommendation of content types. Gateway antivirus scans the content when that action is configured in the proxy rule. You have the AV scan specific action, not allow, not deny, but the action that says AV scan. Intelligent antivirus, which is the total security next layer machine learning model of AV scanning, only scans content when gateway antivirus has already passed the content and it's turned on, of course. APT blocker only scans content and sends it to our cloud sandboxing service if the other two, GAV and AI, AIV, have both passed the scan result as clean. So it's three different layers looking for, number one, gateway antivirus, of course, is looking for known malware that matches any known signature list. Intelligent antivirus is looking for malware that doesn't match on a signature list but may be malicious based on heuristics and behavioral learning models. An APD blocker is looking for a zero-day malware that has evasive techniques that are bypassing those other two. Literally just talked about that. GAV is a signature-based scanner. <laughs> I jumped ahead on myself in my slides. GAV can be enabled on email proxies, FTP, and HTTP, HTTPS proxies. You can scan compressed files, so zip files and things like that, um, unless they have a password attached to them and we can't open it because there's no way to enter a password. But if somebody's sending zip files, you can scan compressed files. It will chew up a lot of RAM, uh, so be aware. Um, if somebody's got like a zip bomb where they've nested, you know, a whole bunch of layers of compressed stuff, compressed malware, uh, that could chew up RAM. So we do limit how long we're, or how deep we're going to scan. Within the GAV action, you can define what you want to do when a scan fails. Do you want to drop that content or allow that content? So typically, if the scan fails, you probably want to drop the content rather than allowing it in. So the actions, allow. Allow is just going to allow anything. I don't care. I'm not going to scan it. Just allow it, whatever it is. So again, typically, you want to be cautious on that. We will allow stuff like text data, like HTML that doesn't have JavaScript or anything like that, flat text files. You can allow that. That's safe, right? Deny is. Uh, just going to drop the message. That's an FTP, and these are specific commands that are sent back. So deny only affects FTP and SMTP. Lock only works with SMTP, uh, and that you know quarantines the file essentially with a CLK extension. Uh, you can unlock that using WSM as an admin, but the user themselves will not be able to actually open that file up. It's you know encrypted and locked. Quarantine. For SMTP, uh, the quarantine server is actually on its way out, so we have new SMTP stuff coming out. That's kind of going away. Remove will strip the attachment. Drop will completely drop the connection, and block adds this, you know, blocks the connection, but also adds that sender to the block sites list.
So lots of different actions. Depending on where you're configuring this, what kind of proxy you're configuring it in, you will only see the ones that are available to you for that proxy. So you don't have to figure out, okay, well, this is an HTTP proxy. Do I need to, you know, deny it or drop it? You won't even have that option. It'll just say drop. So the main thing to remember is, you know, allow, deny, drop, or, uh, uh, yeah, allow, deny, drop. Those are the big ones, right? A couple of additional action categories, depending on what you're working on. So in addition to attachments, you can actually look at the actions that people are trying to do within the connection, right? So for FTPs, it's upload, download. For things like the HTTP proxy, what URL are they going to? What kind of content is it? What kind of body content? And that's going to allow you to inspect specific websites, but also look for things like JavaScript in page, embedded JavaScript on a page, you know, looking at the actual content within the page so that it's not sneaking uh, fileless malware through. And again, we talked about, about this before. You don't have to scan everything. You can allow plain text, HTML, JPEGs, you know, things that typically are not going to have any capability of infecting your device. You can allow it. Uh, you know, until somebody comes up with some way of embedding malware in a JPEG, which I'm sure will happen someday, uh, and then we'll change these recommendations, right? Again, uh, most malware is actually very small. Um, there's not a lot of people who are in, who are embedding uh, ransomware in a Windows 10 ISO, right? So you don't need to scan files that are one gig in size. It's going to be a small dropper, usually. Uh, most uh, attackers will want to put a very small Trojan or some kind of a dropper on a device that then goes out and does a secondary download, and whether it's over Tor or you know some kind of you know peer-to-peer -peer network or just in chunks to try to sneak malware into your environment. So you can usually leave the scan limits where they are at five to ten megabytes. That's going to cover pretty much all known malware that's out there. I don't think there's at least to my knowledge, there is no single piece of malware that exceeded 10 megabytes. I think, well, there might have been one that was like 25 or something, but that was a one-off. Um, and again, within GAV, you can tell it if something is too big to scan, do I want to drop it or allow it, right? Um, most people will allow it because otherwise, again, you wouldn't be able to download those big files, those big ISOs. Intelligent AV, again, that second layer of behavioral learning uh, AI scanner on the T40s and larger is that additional layer of safety after GAV. It only scans if, or only kicks in if GAV is already past the file or content, and it will use whatever actions you've defined in GAV. And it's primarily looking at, you know, office files, PDFs, uh, portable executable files, things that have very common macros or malware embedded in them. APT Blocker is that cloud-based sandboxing service, and it requires both those GAV and uh, IAV to pass a clean result. They have to be enabled, so you have to have TSS, email, FTP, and web proxies, and it shares its results with all of the other services as well. So if APT Blocker d defines something as being ransomware, it passes that back to GAV and IAV, adds it to the known bad list, so you don't have to keep rescanning stuff over and over and over. All right, so if you still have on-premise email servers, there are still a couple Exchange servers out there. Um, hasn't completely gone away yet, but we do have some services for that. SMTP proxy, uh, both incoming to protect mail coming into your mail server and outgoing to protect your clients that are connecting to external mail servers. Not a lot of people use outgoing SMTP anymore. We also, within the SMTP proxy incoming, have allowed domain name rules. Hopefully, if you are managing Exchange or something like that, you're also doing it on the Exchange server. You don't want to have an open relay, right, where anyone can send mail from any domain to any domain. You specifically only allow your domains. Spam blocker, of course, is looking for spam and it's adding a tag to the message uh, that will tag stuff as spam so people can drop it into their junk folder in Outlook. 
that's all I'm going to say about on-prem exchange or on-prem mail because it's you know it's kind of a dinosaur. Not a lot of folks use it in depth anymore. So let's talk about HTTP and HTTPS. These are kind of the the biggies, right? So the HTTP proxy. This is uh, your most common one. This is port 80 traffic. Your clients, typically we're talking about the HTTP client one. It's your users inside browsing the internet on port 80. It's inspecting the client that's coming back from the web server to, did I say inspecting the client? Inspecting the content, the traffic coming back from the web server to your clients, right? Making sure that it matches uh, you know, all of the RFC rules for allowed HTTP traffic, checking for you know services like GAV and web locker and geolocation, et cetera. HTTP server is a little bit different because that again is the one where you have a web server, you're hosting the content and you have people browsing <clears throat> into you. So it's going to be looking for things like cross-site scripting attacks and stuff like that, malicious activity that attackers may be doing. The explicit proxy, I touched on this earlier, this is when you want to force the web browsers on your clients to go through the firebox as a web cache proxy and it is basically going to terminate the connection at the firebox and then have the firewall handle all of the dns lookups the direct connection the content download um, and quite frankly uh, i only know one person who's ever defined the explicit pro proxy in their environment in the years that i've been with watchguard this is not something that is very commonly used and it can be dangerous because if you allow external any external or any in the source field for the explicit proxy people can use you as a relay attack so they can actually use your firebox and hook through it and use it as a proxy and you'll suddenly have people saying hey why are you attacking me i see your ip address uh, as an attack source right so you probably don't need the explicit proxy, but if you do need it, do not put any kind of external address or any in the source field. So when we talk about the proxies, the proxy actions, again, we've got those dot standards, we've got those defaults, right? The client dot standard or dash standard, depending on the, the version you're looking at, is for outbound traffic. It's got our recommendations for basic protections. The default version of that is created by the setup wizard and it uses those recommended basic protections but then it also turns on security services because the defaults are created after we check the feature key so it actually knows okay i've got web locker i've got gav i've got ips i can turn those on so you nine times out of ten when you're starting fresh use the default version because that's your good baseline um or you know you don't even have to edit it usually you can use that as okay i've basically configured my my settings for all my security stuff http server dot standard and dash standard and defaults again those are looking at protecting your web servers lots of settings in these right a lot of different stuff you know url links request methods paths that you can allow or deny uh what kind of responses you want to send back do you want to allow cookies uh block ex executables etc most people don't need, need to change any of these rule sets within the proxies. The defaults are acceptable for general browsing use. There are some times where, uh, especially if you are picking up a configuration from a really old box and you've imported it in over the last several years, you might have people start complaining about what, what's this error message about like URL length too long like i can't browse the web i'm trying to go to this website because urls have just gotten kind of gotten longer over the years right so you may have to tune that a little bit but even that is very very rare uh probably the biggest one that you will need to deal with in here and i'm sure you have is the proxy exceptions right for http and https this is when you run into a website often it's going to be something like a bank uh, sometimes it's like Microsoft downloads where for some reason you can't connect because we are actually inspecting the traffic and the remote site doesn't like the man in the middle type of effect, right? So you have to bypass, create a proxy exception to allow a successful connection. So when you're setting up your HTTP proxy actions, you know, you can 
turn on web locker, you can turn on GAV, turn on reputation, reputation enabled defense, customize a deny message that pops up in the browser, turn on your alarms, enable APT blocker, right? Web blocker, obviously being the most common one, that's gonna work on your website. So HTTP and HTTPS proxies, it's looking at a domain match. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do content inspection on HTTPS uh, for a full domain, but if you wanna do specific URLs, you do. And web blocker, again, as I'm sure you know, allows you to select different categories and allow, deny, or or warn on that traffic based on the category or the specific URL. You can also do things like setting up mandatory safe search, right? Uh, forcing safe search for specific users or groups uh, or globally. On the HTTPS side, HTTPS proxy actually uses a lot of the same settings as the HTTP proxy. By default, we do not have content inspection turned on. So quick definition there, content inspection is when we take the encrypted HTTPS traffic coming from a web server, land it on the Firebox, decrypt the traffic, inspect all of that content, and then re-encrypt the traffic and send it back to the client, the end user. So that's content inspection, which is why you need that certificate that we talked about in the CERT portal, because when we re-encrypt that traffic, we don't have the web server's original certificate, we encrypt it using the Firebox certificate. So content inspection is not enabled by default because it is uh, both a very resource intensive process and it can be disruptive to the users if you haven't completely set up your environment and got those certificates on everything. And for some websites, again, like you know banking websites or something that may be more secure, they will break if they start seeing the traffic getting man in the middle and decrypted. So. Besides all of that, when you're dealing with the HTTPS proxies, you can enforce a minimum version of TLS. So SSL is no longer SSL, it's now TLS, right? So you can enforce whether you want it to be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.0, uh, based on your compliance needs. And also perfect forward secrecy, um, which we kind of talked about a little bit in the VPN world, but basically uh, PFS saying, am I going to regenerate keys every time I start a new connection, right? You can set up domain name rules to match on specific websites, specific wildcards, IP addresses, regular expressions to allow, deny, drop, inspect, different kind of traffic. So these are on the full domain, right? So in here, you know, example.com, not example.com slash whatever. So for us, it would be, you know, uh watchguard.com not watchguard.com slash uh, security services right so we're looking at the domain and domain name rules are very useful for again quickly categorizing and allow inspecting or blocking traffic to or from specific domains and that's outside of web blocker right it's in addition to web blocker when inspect is enabled on that if you have content inspection configured inspect will match that domain name and inspect the traffic and with allow or and inspect you can actually define custom routing so typically this is going to be inbound traffic coming to your web servers right you can actually reroute traffic to different web servers based on what domain name is matched it's a pretty common use case if you're running a web farm. So do I want to allow the traffic and not decrypt it? Do I want to inspect the traffic, which means decrypting it and re-encrypting it? Do I want to just deny the traffic? Do I want to drop the traffic, which actually denies it and sends a response back saying your traffic has been blocked or dropped? And then block drops it and adds the site to the block site list, right? So this is something where you, you just really want to nuke whatever website that user is going to. In the web blocker, of course, I'm sure you know this, you can allow or inspect based on categories. If you know you don't want somebody to be browsing to a specific category of website, you can deny it, right? You shouldn't be inspecting something if you're just gonna deny it later on in another, in another area, right? Uh, for extra protection, I always globally inspect on categorized sites if I can. Um, if you're not doing content inspection, you can drop or deny uncategorized 
websites. So this is going to be, you know, those weird random domains that are registered in a week with long weird numbers in them, like Google with 10 O's in the middle, right? Just, just drop that stuff. Just kill it. All right. So we talked a little bit about content inspection already, right? So content inspection is looking at encrypted traffic, decrypting it, inspecting it, re-encrypting it, right? So you will need, if you are using content inspection, the first thing you will become familiar with is the certificate. The second thing is going to be the exceptions because you will have websites that don't work well with content inspection. So the content inspection bypass uh, list will be important. Um, use the domain name rules to bypass those sites that don't work well with content inspection. We have a list that we have curated and published for sites we know will not work. That's the exceptions bypass list. Uh, you can go in and actually disable those, but you can't add to that list. So the domain name rules is for adding to that. Uh, SSL VPN, by the way, for outbound SSL VPN, if you're trying to connect from behind a Firebox to another Firebox, for example, you need to have that bypass your content inspection. That will absolutely 100% break a VPN. So the way that we operate when we're looking at the HTTPS proxy, we check the domain name rules, we check the exception list, we check the action for the domain name, then we look at web blocker exceptions, web blocker categories, and the specific settings in that action for web blocker. So a couple of other weird things here, content and routing actions. This is specific to the HTTP and HTTPS server actions. So this is again, matching for specific domains or specific paths or URLs to redirect traffic to different web servers based on where those external clients are trying to connect to. So back in, in my pre-WatchGuard days, I used to manage an e-commerce web farm for uh, a company that does groceries, grocery delivery, but they also had a number of direct sale things for stuff like steak and lobsters and and patio furniture of all things, right? But these are all hosted on my same web servers. So based on the domain name that was coming in, I would reroute to different web servers at different times. And also based on my anticipated traffic patterns of when my big shopping days would be, I knew to reroute to my higher power web servers based on my anticipated need. So I'd set up different policies in my firewalls and my load balancers saying, for example, if it's, uh, you know, December 30th, we're going to get a whole bunch of people buying liquor. I need to bounce my liquor sales over to my biggest web server and my biggest database server. So that's what these content and routing actions are used for. Again, weird corner case that you're probably not going to run into a whole lot, uh, especially with, you know, the prevalence of everything being in the cloud anyway. Not a lot of people running web servers behind physical firewalls these days but it still happens. So be aware that they're there in the server actions. Reminders, right? Packet filters are very fast, but limited in scope of what you could do. So if you know you want to absolutely drop traffic, build a packet filter for it. That's going to be super fast. If you know you want to absolutely allow traffic and you have no restrictions on security services, you don't need to inspect it, you don't need to do web block or anything like that, you can build a packet filter for it. When you create the proxies for HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, etc., those proxies have to have some kind of actions defined. Those actions may not do anything, but they have to be there. When in doubt, use our WatchGuard defaults, if they exist from the quick setup, or the dot standards as a starting template so that you know you have at least something that will work, basically work. Narrow the scope of your policies down whenever policy, whenever possible. Right, so don't do any any TCP, right, or any 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 the worst policy in the world. Narrow the scope down. Make sure that you're looking at just the traffic you need to look at and drop everything else. Disable the outgoing policy if you want to be very secure. Uh, guarantee you, you will get calls from your users when you do that. But it's also very interesting to see what your users are doing. Then they start calling you and being like, "Hey, I was." trying to you know torrent this file and it dropped and you're like well you shouldn't be doing that right uh enable content inspection when you can but that's you know a project and we you know often will do a full training session for an hour on just content inspection it does require a lot of planning and a lot of testing 
one thing when you're defining things like domain name rules, learn regular expressions. Learn how to use regex because that will actually be faster in processing instead of doing things like wildcards. In the backend engine, we actually convert everything to regex when we do our domain name matches. And then lastly, you know, obviously turn on logging and dimension, traffic monitor, watch guard cloud to help troubleshoot. Uh, don't log everything. That's going to create a no lot of noise. But while you're building your config, you know, turn on logging for the for the policies you're working on to to help you figure out, you know, what may or may not be working. 